Hi everyone. Okay, here we go with a PowerPoint on the House and Senate compared. Some random information first about Congress that you may see on a unit test sometimes, so let's make sure you've got these points down in your notes. First of all, income and occupations of members of Congress can make them, for the most part, members of the elite in society. Members of Congress tend to be professionals, wealthy, and well-educated, so that would make them part of the elite. So you have the elite in Congress representing the entire nation. Relative to the total population, women are the most underrepresented group in Congress. Women are 50.8% of the population, and yet they certainly are not 50.8% of the members in the House and the Senate. So ladies, it's time to run for office. Next, when members of Congress informally band together in groups to promote their mutual shared interests, these groups are often called caucuses. One caucus um, one of our textbooks talks about is the Mushroom Caucus. I guess they're the Mushroom Growers Caucus. They are uh, interested in promoting that. So um, that's an example. You might have the Hispanic Women Caucus or the Republican Women Caucus or the Democratic Women Caucus. Uh, just a few examples. Last of all, this is important that you understand that after we have the census and seats in the House are reapportioned, and some states gain seats and some states lose seats, new districts have to be drawn, either adding districts or deleting districts, but a new district map has to be drawn. The state legislature of each state is responsible for drawing these maps, these new districts. The majority party is in the state legislature. They draw the districts to favor their party. So the main thing you need to remember for a test question is that who draws those districts? The state legislatures do, and they draw them to favor a certain party. The quote in our book said the House and Senate are naturally unalike. Um, that's an understatement. They're very different. The House, as you know, is closer to the people. Only the House initiates tax bills or revenue bills, not the Senate. The Senate is more deliberative and prestigious than the House. It's, I guess, more distant from the people. It gives advice and consent to the President on appointments judicial appointments, judgeships, and ratification of treaties. It takes two-thirds vote of the Senate only to ratify a treaty, not the House, not involved in this. The House tends to be more involved with domestic affairs. The Senate tends to be more influential with foreign affairs. The House initiates or brings articles of impeachment against an official or president. So if a president has done something or an official has done something, and the House brings those charges, then there is a trial in the Senate. But it all begins with the House bringing the charges. Then the trial is in the Senate. Okay, House of Representatives specifically. Members represent districts determined by reapportionment and the redistricting process that happens every 10 years with the census. The House uh, represents districts, some that are densely populated, like cities, which tend to have congressional districts with citizens that share similar positions. The citizens are very much alike on many issues because they're densely packed. Members of the House of Representatives have short two-year terms, and as a result, they don't want to go against the will of the voters on a given issue because they want to be reelected. So they want to stay in touch with the folks back home and rep represent them the way they want to be represented. Now, not all issues are the same. Some issues people back home don't really care about or don't really know about and don't have an opinion on. So then the representative will be using his own knowledge and conscience to vote, and that's as a trustee. When they vote according to the will of the people, they're voting as instructed delegates. Also, the House of Representatives needs a more formal structure because it's so large and more rules guiding debate. The Senate is elected by the population of the entire state. And every state, as you know, has two senators. 
Senators have to balance or deal with conflicting positions of the people in the state when they're making policy decisions. Um, the book gives us an example of California where you have more liberal voters on the coastal areas and then inland it's more conservative. So the senators have to appeal to both. And um, sometimes they may vote a way some group doesn't like or want them to vote. But the senators aren't that concerned about it or maybe less concerned than the members of the House because they're there for six years. So over a period of six years, people forget. So they may not hold a grudge for a vote a senator made that they didn't like. Senate is more prestigious than the House and it is more informal. They have fewer rules because they have fewer people. So they don't need all the rules in place to uh, keep people well disciplined. All right, now we're gonna talk about the legislative process. I'm just a bill up on Capitol Hill. And I'm sitting here and then I forget the rest of the song. Okay, so it begins with a bill, a proposed piece of legislation. The bill is given a title. If it originates in the House of Representatives, that title will begin with HR. If it begins in the Senate, the title will begin with S uh, in the name to indicate where it was introduced. In the House, the bill is placed in a hopper, which is a wooden box at the front of the chamber. In the Senate, senators announce the bill in a speech. Remember, it's less formal. And um, then bills are referred in either the House or the Senate to committee, to a standing committee, a permanent committee. So the bill is sent to a standing committee. For example, a bill for corn growers would go to the Agriculture Committee, or a bill for tobacco would go to the Agriculture Committee. There, most bills die in committee. It's just a fact that most of them don't ever make it out to see the light of day. The committees are composed of a majority of members of the majority party. So if 60% of the House is, or 70% of the House is in the Republican Party, then 70% of the membership on a committee is probably, will be of the majority or Republican Party. If the majority in the House of Representatives are Republicans, then every committee has a majority of Republicans on it, and the committee chair is a Republican. Committee chairs are chosen usually based on seniority, but not always. Seniority meaning not that they're the oldest person on the committee, but that they've been on the committee the longest. A few points about the majority party in the House of Representatives. It's a little different. The majority party holds committee chair positions. The majority party members control the rules committee. The majority party members set the agenda, control debate. As we know, have a majority on each committee and assigns bills to committee. Very powerful to be the majority party in the House. All right, now we're going to talk about committees. You have standing committees, which are permanent committees. The House has 21, the Senate has 20. Then you have select committees, which are special committees and temporary committees. Uh, the Senate had the Watergate Committee that investigated the whole Watergate issue. It was temporary. It was specially created and then dissolved. Then you have joint committees, which are bicameral, meaning members from both the House and the Senate are working together on these committees. And we'll see an example of a joint committee in a minute. Now, committees have subcommittees. Subcommittees hold hearings with experts to gather information. So let's say, uh, let's not. Let's just say that they hold hearings with experts to gather information, specific information about a bill. Subcommittees mark up bills with wording changes and amendments, and they issue a report explaining the bill. Okay, here's the example I was going to give you. There, for example, the House Committee, Standing Permanent Committee on Foreign Affairs, that's a standing committee. That standing committee has six subcommittees. Subcommittee on Africa, subcommittee on Asia, subcommittee on Europe, uh, subcommittee on the Middle East, subcommittee on terrorism, so, and a subcommittee on the Western Hemisphere. So you can see that a bill specifically about Africa would go to the subcommittee on Africa. 
or a, sub, a bill on terrorism would go to the subcommittee on terrorism. So they're offshoots of the standing committee that had to do with foreign affairs. Okay, debates in the House and Senate. Once a bill is discharged from committee in the House of Representatives, it goes to the Rules Committee. That is the most important committee in the House of Representatives. It sets the length of debate and determines rules for the bill. Open rule means amendments are allowed. Closed rule means no amendments are allowed. It also Those also affect the length of debate allowed. The Senate does not have a rules committee. Instead, the Senate has something called unanimous consent. It just means that every senator has to agree to the rules of debate, and then that's set for a bill. The Senate also has the filibuster. The purpose of the filibuster is to delay action on a bill or halt action on a bill. And that's where we talked about when they would stand up and read a cookbook or tell about their vacation or read the dictionary or the phone book to run out the clock basically, until either they adjourn the meeting or the bill is, is tabled. Cloture is what it takes to end a filibuster, during a filibuster. It takes 60 senators to invoke cloture, which is three-fifths of the Senate. Um, hard to get, but it can happen to end a filibuster. The term is cloture. All right, once a bill has passed in both the House and the Senate, it's all marked up, got many changes tacked onto it. It goes to what's called a conference committee. The conference committee is where both versions, the House version and the Senate version, that have both been marked up, are reconciled. They take all the changes and put them all together and create a compromised version of the bill. And it's the exact same bill that then is sent one more time back to the House and Senate. They vote on it. It's the exact same bill in both chambers. If it passes, then it goes to the president. All right, now the president gets it. The president can sign and it becomes law. The president can veto the bill. Congress can override that veto with a two-thirds vote in both houses, but it rarely happens. The president could do nothing and Congress stays in session, then the bill becomes law after 10 days. And remember that number, 10 days. Or the president can pocket, pocket veto the bill, which means the president does nothing, kind of sits on it for 10 days, and then he doesn't sign the bill, so basically he puts the bill in the pocket. He puts it in his pocket and forgets about it. And if Congress adjourns during that 10 days, the bill dies. That's it. Thanks for listening.